Let us pray. Lord Jesus, our Savior and our friend, we need your help as we hear these ancient words of Scripture. Would you reveal the meaning to us today and help our hearts, minds, and lives be redirected to follow you more completely? Amen. Our first Scripture lesson this morning is from Job chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Eliphaz speaks, Job has sinned. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered, If one ventures a word with you, will you be offended? But who can keep from speaking? See, you have instructed many. You have strengthened the weak hands. Your words have supported those who were stumbling, and you have made firm the feeble knees. But now it has come to you and you are impatient. It touches you, and you are dismayed. Is not your fear of God your confidence, and the integrity of your ways your hope? Think now, who that was innocent ever perished, or who that were upright cut off? As I have seen those who plow iniquity, and sow trouble reap the same. By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of his anger, they are consumed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we have been in a series about gardening um, this summer, and as God is our gardener. So today we are um, in uh, the the New Testament scripture for today is in Luke 13. And Jesus is going to talk about a little gardening again. 13, 1 through 9. At that very time, there were some present who told him, that would be Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered this way, that they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. And then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree, and a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for the fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Amen. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Well, last week I sent you home with some questions, so I'll just talk about a couple this morning. Where are we on this thing, uh, this question? Are the righteous protected from disaster and only the evil receive disaster in their lives? How many agree with that? No takers on that one. No, I know. That, That kind of was a very, very Jewish way of looking at things. If I can clump all Jews together for a moment, they probably wouldn't like that. But it is... It's not what we're used to, or it's not what we've seen in our lives. So what about Job? Was he righteous or unrighteous? A lot of bad stuff happened to him. And I think about our own lives. We all could tell our story this morning of the bad things that have happened. Did it have to do with our righteousness or our unrighteousness? We're going to ponder that a little bit this morning. That's a great, big, large question that... that, uh, The theologians call theodicy, but we're going to just put a a little portion of it. Jesus' conversation with the people in the crowd seems to be pointing to our tendency to see failure or disaster is what happens to someone because of their sin, a.k.a. it was their fault. Wasn't this what Job's friend, especially this friend that Tom read this morning, thank you, he, he was trying to tell Job, you sinned. That's why all this bad stuff happened to you. I'm trying to tell you, if you'd just get your act together, all this stuff would get better. But if you read the story of Job a little more carefully, 
It, the beginning of the story tells us that Satan thought he was really, Job was kind of a good guy and was doing everything right. So he thought maybe he should start a little trouble and see if Job still had such a good point of view. So it was almost as if because Job was too righteous, that's why the trouble came to him. Well, what does Jesus say about this? Jesus claimed that those who had terrible things happen to them were no more sinful than the rest of those in Galilee. The t today, I was thinking of a parallel today, and I thought of the, the, the sadness of the churches who have had a gunman come in. So we could ask the question, were the people in those churches more sinful than we are? That's why the bad thing happened to them? Jesus suggests that just because people have not been harmed by these types of events does not mean that they were without sin. He says, they, everyone, all will perish if they don't repent of their sin. So what are you saying, Jesus? Unless we're perfect, we're doomed? No, unless we repent, <laughs> we're doomed. <laughs> Repentance is the key in all of this. Uh, Jesus, the Messiah, came offering the Jews this chance to repent. He offered that over and over again. And he said, come on, let's live in the kingdom. I'm telling you about this kingdom that we can have right here. But the Jews, for the most part, not everyone, thankfully, they were more concerned about how they could get everybody to be perfect. They, had, they wanted to put more and more and more laws for people to keep, because then they could get people perfect, and then the Messiah would finally come. Well, they kind of missed it, actually. Yes, that, that really wasn't, that, that didn't work. They, that, that wasn't the plan and that didn't work. The problem was that Jesus didn't talk about following the rules more religiously. That was a problem for them. Or ending Roman occupation. They were big on ending Ro Roman occupation. Jesus called them to leave their love of vengeance and to love God. To leave their love of separating the clean and the unclean. They were big about that. And instead to see their neighbor and to love their neighbor. And to leave their love for more and more rules that made it harder and harder to be righteous, and to instead just to confess their own sin and repent. For he told them trouble was ahead unless they did this. Well, then Jesus tells this parable of the fig tree. Now, fig trees, I've heard from some people, are hard to grow for everyone except for John Oster. But, um, but I did reading. I thought, well, I'm going to check out fig trees online. And, and, and there were all these great tips on how to, how to you know, grow a fig tree, and they made it sound so easy. I'm not sure I buy that. My growing this spring has not been so successful. I'm not sure I could grow a fig tree. But evidently, and evidently this fig tree doesn't give me a lot of hope either because the fig tree in the story had gone three years without producing any fruit. And, and then I started looking for Jesus' nice, neat explanation as to what this parable means. Did you find one? No. Jesus doesn't give us a nice, neat explanation. He doesn't define who the fig tree or the gardener or the man are. Hmm. All we know is the man is tired of a tree not producing fruit, so he wants to get rid of it. But the gardener argues that to give him a little more time, the gardener wants a, another chance to try and get this tree to bloom and produce some fruit. N.T. Wright, who is one of my favorite theologians, offers that you could put God or Jesus in either the man or the gardener. They're sort of interchangeable, he thought. But, uh, but you, can, you can read it for yourself and see what you think. So this tr fig tree, well, I got ahead of myself. We've been reading a book. Session, I just finished a book called Success is Who You Are. And there was this really interesting quote in there about failure that I thought was appropriate for today. Sam Adeyemi, Adeyemi, who writes it, says, if you do it, whatever it is, and it doesn't work out, try again. Failures are simply successful people who gave up too soon. Successful people are failures who refuse to give up. And then he adds, the best way to increase your success rate is to increase your failure rate. Success is born out of failure. Turn failure into fertilizer and plant the seed of your new vision in your past failure. End of quote. 
You see, that fig tree had failed, didn't it? It didn't produce any fruit. Because in the first century Palestine, you can, the success of a fig tree was not how pretty and leafy green it was. It was how many figs it produced. It was all about the fruit. Therefore, this tree was a failure. Should they quit planting fig trees? Maybe. Should this tree be turned into furniture or firewood? I don't know what you do with fig tree wood. I didn't research that far. I don't even know if it's good for furniture. But something, they were going to do something else with this tree according to the man who planted it. So what was Jesus' point in this parable, though? Let's not get lost. Well, through our Gardening with God series, we've learned some things about God. God, who plants, and God plants a lot, expects there to be blooms and then fruit. As we talked about two weeks ago, that fruit that matters to God isn't necessarily our accomplishments that look great to the world. Those are not necessarily the ones that God's is talking about that he thinks is our fruit. Because no matter how good anyone may appear, like a fig tree, unless they're producing fruit of the kingdom, they are failures too. And that's not very nice to say. It doesn't sound pretty. But that's what Jesus is talking about in this parable. I hate to tell you this morning. <laughs> God seems to be asking the question through Jesus, how have we borne fruit for the kingdom of God? Well, one way to see this parable from the commentary perspectives is that God sent Jesus to see how the fruit was coming along on his plant, Israel. And for three years, Jesus taught and he encouraged by continuing to, to invite the religious leaders, you know, to, to come his way. But the religious leaders wanted laws for the people to be even more stringent. They wanted people to become more righteous. They were upset with Jesus because he wasn't righteous enough. And they were all hoping this would happen so the Messiah would come and overthrow Rome and everything would be fixed. The whole mess would turn out all the way they wanted it. The trouble was, Jesus kept pointing out to them, is the religious leaders weren't so perfect themselves as they liked to think they were. They were not as perfect as they appeared. Jesus continued to tell them this was not God's plan. God wanted to see fruitfulness in everyone. Well, I didn't tell Tom I was going to tell this story, but it's a pretty it's really an easy story, honey. It's nothing about you. He's a contractor, and they work with plans. Contractors do, not just Tom, but every contractor. You know, you have your, your layout, you know, your, what's that called, floor plan, and then there's those building plans called blueprints. And I have only been married to him 24 years, but I've already learned a tiny bit about building, but don't ask me to build a house for you. I've learned about this much, just enough to be dangerous. But I have learned in listening to him that if people don't read the plans very well or don't know how to read those plans, that that building doesn't look like what the architect imagined. It, it may not even be safe, depending on who your architect is. So it's very important that people read and follow the building plans. And then this week was another great example because the landscaping crew came to start working on the landscaping. And I heard by way of some of our folks, they didn't have a plan when they got here. They had plants but they didn't have a plan. So it was hard for them to know what they were gonna do with those plants. They needed a plan so they could put them in correctly. Well, this is all to say, you know, God has a plan. He had a plan for Adam and Eve, which we talked about weeks ago. He had a plan for Israel, and it was to live in covenant with God. That was the big plan. Living by God's plan meant loving God. And then, loving neighbor and loving ourselves because God had first loved Adam, Eve, Israel, and I would say all of us. This plan was designed and built on trust for those who were to care for and nurture all the people and the garden that God had planted. But instead of producing the fruit of the kingdom and following what Jesus the Messiah had come for, most of the religious leaders thought Jesus should be uh, cut down, should be destroyed, because he wasn't fitting into their plans. Jesus commented on how difficult it can be to enter the kingdom of God, God's garden for those who are rich, those who are rich 
in money, those who are rich in power, or those who are rich in possessions. Yeah, living in the kingdom means we seek to understand and follow God's plan and God's purpose for us and our world. Sadly, many people in Jesus' day, and I would suggest maybe also in our day, continued to put their time and energy into activities and follow after things they thought were most important rather than trying to understand what God's will and what this kingdom that Jesus was talking about. Repent. That's what I talked with the children about. You saw our demonstration. So if you didn't know what repenting, do you understand now? <laughs> I, I, that just came to me. I just meant to turn around. That's what it means. Jesus invited those who are listening to repent, to quit looking for the guilt and the sin in others and to look within themselves. Where was their need for repentance? How had they been living? What was God calling them to be and do? Had they missed the one who was to come, even the Messiah who was standing right in front of them? Oh, how sad that makes me, that they had Jesus right there and they didn't know. Were they sterile like that fig tree, not bearing the fruit for the one who had planted them? Well, you know it's going to come to this. I'm going to ask you the same question. What about us? Do we need to repent? And this is a very good time to contemplate that because we're coming to the table of our Lord Jesus. It is a very fruitful place. We have the fruit of the vine and the fruit of the field right here in front of us. And so it brings us to a place of kind of a decision. We get to do this each month. We get to re-up if we want. You know how your, the plan comes on the email and says, well, if you don't, it's your turn to re-up. And if you don't tell us, then we're going to re-up you. Well, Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to re-up you automatically. He lets you come to the table each month or each week for some churches and say whether you want to, do I want to choose to eat and belong to Jesus again today? Do we need to be fertilized? Hmm. If we recognize in ourselves places that maybe we have failed at producing fruit, in the kingdom, well, that we can turn that into fertilizer and it become the place where we repent. That fertilizer helps us, helps us to turn around and allow God in Christ to dig around us so they can let some of that living water. Is that what you have to do to your plants? You dig around them? Because you've got to let the water in. Sometimes it gets hard in that soil. You've got to dig around and let the living water in to those places whatever your roots are, that maybe they need a little help. Maybe my roots need a little help, where we need a little rebirth. In our repentance, we may find that we can, with God's grace and mercy, begin to produce the fruit that will be pleasing to him. Let's pray about that. Loving God, you are quite a gardener. And I have been just surprised week after week to see all the places you take us in Scripture that has to do with gardening. And Lord, I thank you that today this is a hard Scripture. But it is an excellent reminder that you care about the fruitfulness of your church. You care about the fruitfulness of our collective planting and, I, and about us individually too, but you're about what this church and what the church universal is producing. What kind of fruit are we offering for the world, for you, in Jesus' name? So Lord, we need to contemplate this more than an hour on Sunday morning. We need your help to think about that in our own personal lives and is our lives together as people who claim your name, Jesus. So this morning, Lord, I lift us up and I lift up that word repentance and I invite you to speak in us by your Holy Spirit because I don't know the hearts of each who sit here this morning. Only you do. Thankfully, Lord, only you know us. And so I thank you for showing us when we're quiet enough to hear the places where you want to prune, where you want to dig, 
where you want to bring new life and produce fruitfulness. I thank you that age has nothing to do with that. For as little as Noah is, or as old as our oldest congregants are, you are still actively working as our gardener, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for that. And Lord, today we come in our prayer time because we come to intercede, to intercede for those who have asked. And it is a humble thing to ask for prayer, and it is a good thing to ask for prayer. It is what you call us to do, to not only be prayers, but to be askers. So this morning there are people who have asked, Lord, we lift up Bill and Janet Starr, and we thank you that Bill has finished one surgery and he has one to go. And we're grateful that in the midst of devastating diagnoses, you are still mighty God. And so, Lord, we bless you for the surgery to come and we thank you for the provisions for Janet while he's having that surgery. And we thank you for how you are mightily at work in their lives, even now. Lord, we lift up Dorothy um, Teeter's brother, Wilburn, who has brain cancer. And she texted me to tell me he's not doing so well. So Lord, we lift him up to you and we thank you for being with him. And Lord, I, I don't know Wilburn, but I pray that somebody is telling him the good news, that you love him and that you have not forgotten him, even though that can feel that way when you have some, a diagnosis like that. And Lord, we lift up folks who are sad this morning. We lift up Zachary's family and friends where he was 17, Lord, and that's awful young to go to be with you. But Lord Jesus, I thank you that you did not refuse us, but you, you received Zachary and you have a comfort that is greater than I can imagine for all those who love and for whom Zachary was dear. So I trust that even as we trust in your resurrection and we lift the Copenhaver family for the same, their little two-year-old is no longer present with them but she is with you. And so Jesus, we thank you for your comfort, but we also thank you for the resurrection, which is a powerful, powerful reason to keep taking step after step when we are sad, to remember in the midst of our tears that you are greater than even the worst things we can imagine or that happen. And Lord, we lift up praise to stay because, you know, we pray both. We praise you that Don is home with Judith and he's with Hugger and he's with Jeff. And he told me that, that he would be so happy to go home. So Lord God, thank you for answering that prayer. And thank you for making that possible in all the ways that had to happen for, for him to be home. Lord, we thank you. We bless you. We give you praise and thanks. And we lift up other concerns that are unspoken this morning. That you know that you hear the whispers of our hearts. Even an interview that's coming tomorrow. Even a diagnosis that's better. We praise you and thank you. We pray all this in your mighty and wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. As we prepare um, to move forward, we do so by giving, giving back. We receive the word of God and we give back. We give back our lives. And sometimes we even give back tangibles of what we've been given. Let's do that now.
Bless you, Lord, for your bounty. For, Lord, you always are producing fruit. That's what you do. You produce the fruit in our lives. We thank you for it. We thank you for the overflow, the grace and gifts given this morning and the hearts that are turned towards you. Would you take them and use them and they would be a blessing and they would show forth and give you glory. Amen. You may be seated. It is true. None of us is fit to come to this feast today, but we're invited anyway because of Jesus. This is the glorious feast of the kingdom of God. It's just a foretaste of that banquet we all get to come to one day. So all who trust in Christ are invited here to enjoy. We will serve you in the pews when you get the, the bread, hold it, and we'll take together and do the same with the cup. Let's pray. Glorious and loving Father God, you are planter and gardener extraordinaire. We stand in awe of how this world demonstrates your creative genius. Bless you, Father, for loving us so very much that you sent Jesus after us to save us and love us and call us to follow him, which leads us to you. Thank you, Father, for this bread and this cup, the food and drink for our bodies and our souls this day. May we continue to learn and to grow to be fruitful in and through Jesus. May our seat at this table today, Jesus, energize us to find how we can bloom and produce fruit of your kingdom to the glory of the Father. As we come to this table, we look forward to your restoration of, our, of all this world. As we take the bread into our mouth, we receive your life and strength. As we take the cup on our tongue and taste that, we receive the forgiveness, the taste of healing for the sterile places in us, even for our failures. And now, Lord, we dedicate ourselves again to becoming disciples of you, who is our bread, the bread of life. And we allow your blood of this new covenant to wash away anything that would divert us from serving you. We choose again to abide in you, Jesus, to abide in your love, and to let you and your words abide in us, that we may bear fruit to love one another as you have so dearly loved us, our Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. On the night when Jesus was going to be betrayed and he was joined with his disciples, he took that bread at the table. And when he had blessed God, he took it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that is for you. Take, eat it, do this in remembrance of me. And then he took that cup, one of the cups at the table that was poured out and said, this is the cup of a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you call forth, tell forth my death until I come again. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you bring heaven even into this place, this meal that has, has your body and your blood that is, that is forever resurrected with the Father, but comes close in us to put that eternal life, to bring eternal fruit of the kingdom planted in us to grow out of us. Lord, we look forward to seeing more and more of that fruit as you continue to garden in and through and around us. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Stand if you are able, please, as we sing our closing hymn, Amazing Grace, 649. Just the first four, just the first four verses.
hold that spot because I'm going to do the benediction and then you get to sing the last verse. So I want you this week to think back to when that little gardening started in you. When did God plant the seed in you to become fruitful in the kingdom? And think this week all the ways that you've already bloomed, but maybe there's some place that still needs God's pruning, God's gentle care. So I invite you to think on that and pray on that and to grow mightily. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, amen.